Where was I when Superman died on that November day? I don't recall where I was at the moment I finished Superman number 75. I just know I was reading the Death of Superman story. Because DC Comics slash Warner Brothers very wisely leaked to the press that Superman's death was going to happen after a multi-part storyline. And being a good comic book fan, I wanted to get on board for this monumental event and see how they could kill off such an important superhero that I had been a big fan of. I wasn't currently reading the Superman books at the time, but I would pick up an issue or storyline occasionally when a cover grabbed my attention. I was subscribed to the Batman comics, and I would receive them in the mail, but I lived in a small town, so I usually would only get other comic books if I was along on a shopping trip or running errands in a larger town or city. My birthday is October 30th, so I would have turned 15 while the Death of Superman storyline was taking place. And at the time, Jason Todd was still dead. Barry Allen was also still dead. So comic book deaths seemed to have a finality, and I had to see how Superman died, and if it would last. I loved the story, I was hooked, and I also liked Funeral for a Friend, Reign of the Superman, and the Return of Superman storylines very much. And I remember a deal I made with my mom, that if I joined a jazz band, she would get me a subscription to the Superman books. I played the trombone. I accepted. You're listening to Just Another Fanboy Presents The Death of Superman, and this is episode number seven, Death of a Legend. Hello and welcome to Just Another Fanboy Presents. I'm your host, my name is Steven, and our introduction this week was submitted by Matt, the host of the Superman Radio Revisited podcast, which is a podcast that you should be listening to, especially if you want to listen to the old Superman radio dramas. And Matt, I want to thank you for this intro, which did make me laugh. Uh, I'm always a fan of the silliness juxtaposed against a serious topic. I mean, if you consider the death of a fictional character who wears tights and a cape, a serious topic. Anyway, Matt included the following in his email. Full disclosure, That is not me playing the trombone. It is a clip I found on YouTube. Either way, it was a nice touch. And speaking of full disclosure, I've actually had Matt's submission for over two weeks now. I just didn't know it. It was just sitting there in my spam folder. So I'm glad you said something, Matt, because me, if I had been the one submitting an intro like this to a podcast and I didn't hear anything back and didn't hear it on an episode, I would have worried over it for a month or more, wondering why the host wasn't playing my submission and wondering what might I have done or said, uh, you know, what did I do to make this host hate me? And then I would have spent another month worrying over the decision about whether or not to reach out to the host. And once I then finally decided that I probably should reach out to the host, I would spend another month or so worrying about how I would even broach that subject with the podcast host. And uh, yeah, that's me. Regardless, thanks again, Matt. I really appreciate it. And hey, to all the others listening right now, if you would like to submit an introduction to be played on a future episode of Just Another Fanboy Presents, All you got to do is record yourself answering the following question. Where were you when Superman died? Then 
send that file to justanotherfanboy at gmail.com. Just make sure to include in the email how you want to be identified on the episode, where the folks can find you online, and any podcast or project that you would like me to plug. I, of course, reserve the right to refuse any submission as I'm not about to plug a podcast or a website that promotes hate speech or really anything that I might find offensive. And I'm the one that gets to define what is or isn't offensive in this case because, well, it's my podcast. For more information, check out the Where Were You When Superman Died bonus episode right here on this feed. And if you don't get a response from me within a week, follow up. (laughs) I mean, the email could be in my spam folder. Uh, You know, maybe hit me up on Twitter if it's still around by the time this episode goes out. And my handle over there is at Stephen or else. All right. So today we're going to ease into week number seven of the Death of Superman epic crossover event with the issue that was released this week 30 years ago, and that's Adventures of Superman number 498. It had a cover price of $1.95, and the title of this issue is Death of a Legend. It was written by Jerry Ordway, pencils by Tom Grummet, inks by Doug Hazelwood, letters by Albert de Guzman, and the colorist was Glenn Whitmore. And we'll start, as we always do, with a synopsis from DCFandom.com. As Bloodwind is forced to spirit ice away due to injuries sustained fighting Doomsday, Jimmy asks Lois if Superman is truly dead. Double X tells those gathered that he cannot detect any brainwaves. SCU forces go to make sure Doomsday is dead, but panic after rumbling occurs. Double X reassures them that he's gone as well. As everyone continues mourning, Lois screams out for someone to save him. As the Guardian attempts CPR, EMS crews arrive to take over. Dan forces himself to turn away and discovers the injured Matrix as he does. Before he can help her, Luther arrives to take her away. As the EMS crews continue, Kat and Jimmy lead Lois away and suggest trying to find the doctor who helped Superman a number of times. Kat's able to convince Jimmy to get Lois out and try to focus on their jobs as reporters. Watching one of Kat's reports is Jose Delgado and Kat's son, Adam. Adam blows it off, causing Jose to snap at him and send the kid running. Musing at his gangbuster outfit and how helpless he was, he snaps and destroys the TV after a reporter blasts the fallen hero. In Smallville, Jonathan and Martha pray for their son's survival. In LexCorp Tower, Luther is able to convince Matrix to return to her Supergirl persona. In Metropolis, Westfield and the rest of Cadmus go to load Doomsday's body away and attempt to take Superman away should they fail to resurrect him. Dan doesn't take this well and punches him in the gut. With Westfield down, Guardian takes over, using a shock trooper and a device by Professor Hamilton to create a powerful defibrillator. Despite this, Superman never recovers. In the Daily Planet, Jimmy's disgusted over the news reports trying to be the first to proclaim Superman's death. He even feels disgusted using the pictures of his death, but Perry talks him out of it, declaring that the world has to see him as the hero he was. After Lois has finished writing her story, Jimmy offers to walk her home, all of them worried about the missing Clark Kent. So yeah, this was a very well put together issue, I thought. It's one that needed to be uh, made. It's one, It's a story that needed to be told. I know that there are a lot of people out there that uh, read superhero comics and they feel that an issue should not go by without some kind of superhero battle. I'm not one of those people and we certainly don't see a superhero battle in this issue at all. But what we do see is the the group of people who were there when Superman fell trying to rally and trying to resuscitate Superman. Lois, for example, she's somewhat in denial. She won't accept that Superman has died. Uh, You know, on the one hand, she's coming at it from look at everything that Superman has done in the past and he's always survived. And on the other hand, unbeknownst to everyone else, she's coming at it as uh, someone who just lost her fiance, uh, the love of her life, the man she was going to spend the rest of her life with. And so she's definitely going through the denial stage of, of grief. And I like that they spent the time here 
trying to revive Superman, I think it would have been a mistake going straight from Superman falling at the end of issue 75 of Superman to a funeral or them loading him up on a, a truck or something or a, 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 in a hearse or whatever. But um, I want to real quick kind of back up and talk about the cover for a moment. It is, uh, well, it features a photograph of Superman, not an actual photograph, uh, uh, you know, Tom Grummet's art of what is a photo, black and white photograph taken from above of Superman laying in the middle of the cracked pavement. Looks like uh, it's, you know, basically when he fell, we have all these, these, these cracks coming out from where he fell, the, the, the impact of his uh, body being forced to the ground uh, from, by Doomsday. And their, their final blows uh, caused all this asphalt to uh, crack around him. And he's, he's there uh, prone, costume in shreds, and he's, he's passed on at this point. This is, we don't get this during this issue, but we find out that this is a photo that ha- was taken by Jimmy Olsen. And I believe, because I know they will talk about this at a future point. I believe this is a photo that wins him a Pulitzer. And we do get a moment in the issue where he he feels guilty about taking these photos and doesn't want, you know, he has a moment where he he doesn't want them to be used and, and wants to tear them up and destroy the negatives. And, and Perry has to talk him out of it. Um, we get this bit here with Westfield from Cadmus trying to take uh, not only Doomsday's body, but Superman's body as well. Of course, the cops are there, Maggie Sawyer with her special crimes unit. I couldn't remember the name of their unit, I think, that in the last episode. Uh, it is a special crimes unit. They, they actually name it in this issue. Uh, but she and her right-hand man, Dan Turpin, they don't, they're not going to allow somebody like, you know, somebody just to come in and start and cart off Superman's body. First of all, Westfield doesn't in any way identify himself. He just kind of shows up with a bunch of these lackeys and they start trying to uh, uh, load up Doomsday's body. And it's not until Maggie Sawyer and Turpin confront him that he's, he's, he still doesn't quite identify himself. He just says, let's just say we're on the same side here, you and me. We're authorized to take both Superman and the body of Doomsday. And that's when, you know, Maggie says, you're not taking anything with, unless you show me some paperwork. And Westfield tries to uh, sick Guardian on them. You know, you tell him that I'm taking this, these bodies, you know, don't, don't let him stop me. And Guardian is against it as well. He, we were learning here, if you've not read Superman up to this point, and I hadn't, still haven't. I, I don't, you know, I read, again, I was into Superman post-crisis during the burn era. And uh, dropped off after Byrne left and didn't come back until this storyline. So when it comes to Cadmus and who Westfield is, I didn't know anything about them going into this storyline. And it's, it's at this point that it's kind of made somewhat clear that while Cadmus may be uh, uh, an organization that is not an e- they're not an evil organization. They're just, uh, you know, they're they're kind of a secretive group that does uh, crazy scientific stuff. Westfield, however, cannot be trusted. And you get that from Guardian here, basically, at this point, who just comes out and says he, he doesn't trust Westfield's motives. And then it's at this point that Westfield is basically, you know, well, Guardian tells Westfield that he wants uh, one of their, one of Cadmus's power platforms to try to jolt Superman's heart because they have been trying to reset re- resuscitate Superman. Um, Guardian himself tries CPR and comments that trying to breathe air into Superman's lungs is like trying to inflate a steel tank, basically. And uh, the EMTs arrive, and there's really not much they can do. They try to use the paddles, you know, the defibrillator on Superman, and that, you know, it's. You can't even stick a needle in him to to run an IV. And Guardian's idea is that if they have uh, a larger power source, if they can pump more power into maybe some makeshift defibrillators, maybe that will uh, jolt Superman's heart back to life. And uh, 
Westfield basically tells him that, yeah, I'll, I'll let you do that, but you, uh, the way he puts it, you helped me put these two cowboys in their place. And he's, he's pointing his thumb toward Maggie and Dan. And uh, Dan Turpin is one of these, you know, kind of old school uh, cops who at the, you know, as I'm, when I was reading this back then in the 90s, I'm reading this and Dan Turpin's all like, ah, Miss Sawyer's a lady, bozo, why I oughta. And uh, Westfield cuts him off and at one point refers to uh, Sawyer. He's, he's I, I would hate or I, I, I hesitate to call a cigar smoking chick a lady. And Dan, at, that's at that point where he goes, that tears it. And he punches Westfield in the stomach. And I remember reading this back in the 90s going, thinking, you know, yeah, that's right, Dan, get him. This guy's a, a jerk. Beat him up. And, uh, you know, reading it now, there's there's a big part of me that's like, yep, that's what cops do. They, uh, despite the fact that Westfield, of course, is being a jerk, uh, Turpin, because he's a cop. He's just going to punch him in the stomach and and he's he doesn't care because before he pops Westfield, Westfield, you know, when he talks about Maggie being a, a cigar smoking chick, he yells out, then give me your badge number. And that's when Turpin hits him and he goes and, 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 you know, after he punches him, he says, and forget the badge number. Just remember Dan Turpin, T-U-R-P-I-N. The boys call me terrible, though I don't know why. And, uh. All I can think of is is at, at this point reading this nowadays is here's another cop abusing his power and he is in no way worried that he will be in any kind of trouble doing what he did because uh, the big blue shield will protect him, right? And I know that that's not, that wasn't what this was meant to be. It was meant to be um, Westfield is the bad guy, still is, and uh Dan Turpin and Maggie are the good guys and it's, you know, it's okay for the good guys to punch the bad guys once in a while. And while I do agree with that in certain situations, um, Dan does need to be, uh, punished. And maybe that's, maybe that is kind of the purpose. Maybe that is what they're trying to say here with Dan basically saying you here, here's how you spell my name. I'm not, you know, he's not worried. It's not that he's not worried he's in, that he's going to get punished. It's not that he's saying nobody's going to punish me because I'm a cop and we look out for our own. Maybe it's more they're trying to say, uh, I know I'm going to get punished for this and I deserve to be punished for this. But dang it, I got to do what I got to do. This guy disrespected my my captain and my friend and 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 I'm going to punch him in the stomach to 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 heck with the consequences. Right. Which isn't necessarily a good thing either. but. um Professor Hamilton shows up at this point with uh, something he refers to as a as an energy collecting unit. Uh, with him is Babowski helping him carry the unit, and uh, they they take one of these Cadmus gliders with the shock cannons and fire the shock cannons into the energy collector to uh, collect the energy, and they are able to hook that energy collector up to these paddles to use as basically a superpowered defibrillator, which is becoming a, a word that's becoming more and more difficult to say <laughs> the more times I say it. Uh, Bibowski has his force field belt on and he, he turns that on and, and uh, the shock trooper, it, well, the shock trooper, the guy with the, the, the fricking glider who has the shock cannons on it, he's, he's ready to grab the paddles and, uh, do the defibrillating, but uh, Babowski jumps forward and using the 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 speech that they write for him, and by that I mean the the dialect, the way they 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 spell out his words. Uh, he says, "I'm gonna do it. Hand me dem paddles. I owe it to Superman on account of he's my favorite." And uh, Superman, when he says it, is always spelled S O O P E R M A N. Superman and favorite is always spelled S A V apostrophe r i t favorite favorite i don't know I, I don't know how favorite favorite i'm gonna i'm gonna keep saying that and you're gonna end up turning the podcast off favorite 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 yeah i'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it favorite uh but you know he can't say words with a, a th at the beginning of them whether it's the them they he uses a d instead hand me dem panels he was the best I don't care what they say, you know, that's, that's the way he talks because he's an ex-boxer and he's got a heart of gold and everybody loves him. He's just a big, dumb, 
super generous, super friendly guy. Babowski is the guy that you want as your friend. And as long as you're a good person and uh, don't give him any reason not to like you by, you know, of course, being a bad person, he's going to be your friend. That's just who he is. He's a he's actually a very wonderful character. Um, You know, he's one of these guys that I think most of us wish that we were like because he's he's he tries to live his life by the same values as Superman. He just doesn't have superpowers, but he's the, he's the first one that's going to stand up and help somebody provide them, you know, in, in any way he can, whether it's by protecting a, a weaker person, uh, from getting beat up by a, you know, a stronger person or giving, uh, somebody that five bucks that they need to, to get a meal that day. That's just who Babowski is. He just, just don't like the way they, <laughs> they make him talk. Superman. It's like they they have to point out that he's not the biggest brain on the shelf. And I don't I don't think they need to do that. You know, it's it's there there to a certain extent, it's it's almost as if they're saying, I just I I don't know, I just almost feel like they're going, Babowski is this super nice guy, super friendly, he's super generous, he's just probably one of the most wonderful people on the earth, despite the fact that he's not very smart. You know, it's like they gotta throw that part of it into your face. And I just I don't know. Doesn't make me angry. It just makes me shake my head and wish they wouldn't do stuff like that. Because the the reason, you know, when he takes the paddles and, you know, he's going to be the one to do it, not not just because Superman is his favorite. He, Superman is his favorite person in the world. It's, uh, it's also because, as he said, no one's going to miss a pug like me if things go bad. And uh, nobody stands up and says, oh, come on, Bibbo. You don't have to do that. Let one of us do it. You know, even Guardian, who... This is what he does. You know, he's he's a costumed hero. This is, you know, and he doesn't even stand up and go, no, Mr. Babowski, this is this is my job. I need to do that. He just the the moment Babowski says no one's going to miss a pug like me if things go bad. Guardian says, you're a good man, Babowski. Like, OK, uh, I guess uh, I didn't want to try to put my life on the line for this. But since you volunteered, yay, high fives all around. And so they fill the energy collector with this energy from the shock cannon. Bibbo hits him with the paddles. The, the, the thing explodes shooting, uh, Bibbo, f- you know, five or six feet away and leaving him, uh, with smoke rolling off his, 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 his body, even though he's not, he's not dead. I don't want to make that sound like he's dead because he did have a force field on, but it, it didn't do anything. It didn't, uh, didn't revive Superman. Uh, but Bibbo's ready for another round. There's, there, you know, double X confirms that there, there's still no brain activity and, they try it again with, again, no results. We get that bit in here with Jose Delgado, who is the uh, gangbuster, who is, uh, he's not a super powered guy. He's just a, a, a dude who puts on um, basically modified police riot gear, I believe is what he wears uh, and with the helmet. And he goes out, he used to go out and uh, bust gangs. He was a, you know, a non-powered vigilante. And now he apparently is Cat Grant's boyfriend live in or at least he's there in the apartment with uh her son and he is very upset about superman dying and and even as the synopsis says lashes out at adam cat grant's son who uh they're they're watching the news adam has the remote and he he's bored i mean adam's like 10 10 11 12 years old and he's bored he doesn't want to watch this he flips over to a cartoon and that's when jose flips out and very violently snatches the remote out of the kid's hand, causing the kid to burst into tears and run out of the room. Uh, Jose then pulls out his gangbuster outfit, and um, he had apparently promised Cat that he wouldn't put it back on anymore. But now with Superman gone, he's 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 starting to feel like maybe he should. And that's when somebody on the news, as they are uh, ending their report, says, "So I guess that Superman wasn't so super after all." This has been a WMET news break, and Jose doesn't like that, and he throws his helmet into the TV destroying. We get the bit with uh, Jonathan and Martha. Very, very sad scene. The the two of them just uh, sitting in front of the TV. The The first panel of the page is Jonathan turning the TV off as the, the news report coming from the TV is saying, again, a source close to the battle site has confirmed that no brain activity was detected in the Man of Steel. And that's when click. He turns it off and Jonathan says, fool doesn't know what he's talking about. And then you get just two panels of Jonathan and Martha sitting next to each other, each in their own recliner, because 
Well, they're not recliners. We get a pan out and see the regular chairs. But that's that's what you have when you have uh, folks that are retirement age. My parents each have their own recliner and they sit in each one with a little table between them and they watch the TV. And that's what Jonathan and Martha are doing. And we get two panels of them just staring in, in sad disbelief into into the camera, which is supposed to represent the TV. And then finally, Martha says, what if they're right? And they both stand and embrace. And Jonathan says, we keep on praying to the good Lord for our boy, Ma. And that that's that's the only bit we get with uh, Jonathan and Martha, which I think these scenes with Jonathan and Martha are essential. Um, we need to see Clark's parents and how they are taking the news. I mean, it's just those two and Lois. Those, those are the only three we've seen in this series so far that were watching the fight and have witnessed the aftermath that know that Superman is Clark. So to them, you know, everybody else is mourning the loss of the the world's greatest hero. And these three individuals are, are mourning the loss of a loved one. And so I think those scenes are essential. We get uh, the scene with Supergirl and Lex, Lex Luthor II, who uh, I'll keep reminding you is a clone of the original Superman in a much more youthful body with red hair and a red beard and is supposed to be Lex's long lost son from Australia. Supergirl, they refer to in the synopsis as Matrix. And that is that's that's who she is. She's not, you know, we talked about this a bit in episode zero. This is not Kara from Krypton. This is not Superman's cousin. This is a uh uh, a protoplasmic being called the Matrix from a from a completely different universe, parallel universe that can change its shape, and it uh, has taken on the personification of Supergirl to, uh, I guess, honor Superman uh, because they um, became friends and became close, and I think she even stayed with Jonathan and Martha at one point before Lex Luthor II came on the scene after his father, quote unquote, died, and. Uh, Again, this Lex to the public eye, everybody loves him. Superman thinks he's a great dude. Supergirl obviously likes him. They're a, they're a couple. And he is able to coax Matrix into transforming back into Supergirl. And she does say that it was the, the most difficult change she's ever experienced. And uh, Lex points out that must account for the bruises because even though she is a shapeshifter, she still uh, is showing bruises when she changes back. And I, I just have to point out that I don't know what Supergirl's, what what her power level is compared to Superman. You know, this version, this, this Matrix character who is Supergirl. But it says something uh, about her power level compared to Superman and who Doomsday was. When you think about the fact that when she finally got into the fight, this is after hours of Superman and Doomsday fighting. But when she finally gets there, Doomsday literally punches her once and he punches her so hard that it forces her back into this kind of near protoplasmic state. And she's just down for the count. One hit and she's just she's done. And I, I think that says says quite a bit. There is a moment here during this scene where Lex, to me, kind of slips up. You know, he's supposed to be posing as this super nice guy. Uh, everybody loves him. and. As he's there with Supergirl, who is still in her protoplasmic state, he says that, uh, you know, she's lamenting the fact that she wasn't able to help Superman, you know, now that he's dead. And he said, love, if I could turn back time again, I'm not going to try to do the Australian accent. I'm just not love. If I could turn back time, I would have sent you and Team Luther in to help. Superman would have owed me his very life and I never would have let him forget it. And, you know, that's obviously something that old Luther would have said. And uh of course, Supergirl being in the state that she's in and being uh, in a lot of pain doesn't catch it, but it's it's there. It's obvious. It's right in your face. And I found it kind of funny. And then we end the issue. We're at the Daily Planet. This is where um, they have the, the news feed up and they're watching um, Cat Grant talking about the Superman's death. And uh, Jimmy is is uh, he's very upset that the media as he puts it, uh, they're, they're crawling over everyone else to be the first to officially pronounce Superman dead. And he's just, he's sick. He, he's sick to his stomach because, you know, Jimmy Olsen is Superman's pal. Superman was his friend. And 
it's here that he talks about wanting to 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 tear up all his pictures and destroy the negatives. And Perry White tells him, Olson, one of these photos will serve to remind this city, no, the world, of the tremendous sacrifice one man made. His passing has left a great void in all of us, but we're still journalists and we've got a paper to publish. And then he reminds him, you know, think of what Lois is going through. And it's at this point that they, that everybody, you know, that some of these folks, Perry was the first one to think of it, but uh, Jimmy wasn't thinking about it at all. And it's the, the you know, what the, Lois is uh, missing Clark. And they have to address at some point where Clark is. Superman's dead. Where's Clark? And they address this by making Clark uh, one of the uh, hundreds of missing people who were um, in buildings that collapsed during the fight, you know, who were maybe underground in the subway when the ceiling collapsed. And there's just a lot of people in Metropolis that are missing in within all this destruction. And so the story is at this point, the story that Lois has to now um, get behind and tell, uh, you know, she can't openly mourn Clark's death because nobody knows that Clark is dead as far as they know he's missing. And so that that adds another element, I think, to uh, to this story and for Lois, you know. Jonathan and Martha, they have they they're going to have to go through the same thing with their their friends and the, the 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 loved ones that are around them that don't know that Clark is Superman. Is that um, they will constantly during this time be trying to keep Jonathan and Martha's spirits up, and the same thing with the Lois's friends. By you know, I'm sure they'll find Clark. I, I you know he, he's 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 missing. They I, I'm sure he'll they'll find him. It, it's it's going to be all right. But Lois and, and uh, Jonathan and Martha know it's not going to be all right. You, you know, you can say that all you want. But the one thing that we can't say out loud to you is that Clark is dead. Clark is Superman. They're the same person. And I'm not sure why they can't admit that at this point. Um, you know, the whole purpose behind a secret identity for superheroes is so that their loved ones will remain safe. But once a superhero has died... Do their supervillains still want to go and punish their loved ones? Maybe the more psychotic ones uh, probably still would. You know, I I, I would imagine uh, like a Green Goblin over in the Spider-Man books, uh, Norman Osborn is as psychotic as he was if he, you know, learned that uh, and he, you know, yes, I know that he knows that Peter Parker and Spider-Man are the same person. But before he knew that, if Spider-Man died and then he learned that Spider-Man was Peter Parker, he would probably still want to kill um, kill Aunt May, especially if Spider-Man didn't die by his hands. So he feels like he didn't get his revenge. So in order to do that, he'd have to do the next best thing, which would be kill Aunt May. That's, that is, that's the only reason I can really think of is why they would want to continue to, uh, keep Superman's identity hidden. And, and actually, now that I'm thinking about it, probably more to the fact that can you imagine what life would be like? For, for poor Jonathan and Martha, if the world learned that not only uh, the, the, the greatest hero in the world die, uh, sacrificing his life for everyone, but then it's also learned that he was Clark Kent, um, Jonathan and Martha would never know a moment's peace. You know, it's, 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 it's the one thing that, that they do have at this point is that they get to mourn the loss of their son um, the way they would want to, and that's quietly. Uh, instead of um, in front of, you know, without uh, a crap ton of reporters outside the house, constantly throwing questions at them whenever they show their face. So, yeah, that makes more sense. That makes more sense. I see I come around. I'm not the I'm not the smartest tool in the laundry cart. But uh, eventually the dryer gets out the wrinkles is what I'm trying to say. But yeah, this was a uh, you know, I think I mentioned in a previous episode that Funeral for a Friend, this is we're in the second act, basically, of the whole death and return of Superman event. Uh, the first act was the the death of Superman. This is Funeral for a Friend. And it's not my favorite part of the the four acts. It's, uh, to me, I find it slow and um, just not a big fan of it. But uh, I did enjoy this issue. I, you know, it's it's one of those things that you you can't, you you have to have 
funeral for a friend. You you can't kill somebody like Superman. You can't kill that character and then not spend a few weeks um, mourning that loss and talking about what the world is is going to be like now without him before you introduce these four new Supermen. So um, I think we're off to a, well, we were off to a bad start with Funeral for a Friend last week with that Justice League episode. Did not enjoy that at all. Didn't make a secret of it last week. But we're we're back into the the main, you know, because the main books were back. We're in the Superman world now. I don't know what I'm trying to say, folks. Uh, but yeah, good issue. Great art. Good story. Uh, very good at, at tugging at the old heartstrings. And uh, this is an issue that that needed to be made following the death of Superman, because we we got uh, most of the the five stages of grief. Here in just this one issue, we get the denial. Uh, we get some bargaining. Um, we don't quite get de- uh, 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 closure at the end of it or acceptance. Um, you know, may, w- with some folks, yes, I think with Perry and and Jimmy and others, um, they've reached the acceptance level. Uh, Lois has not at this point. So yeah, that was the issue. I don't. I don't think there's really anything else I need to say except for uh, join me back here next week. And we'll, we will uh, we'll look at Action Comics number 685, which features Supergirl on the cover. So make sure you join me for that, he says, with very little hype and excitement in his voice. OK, so I want to thank you all for listening to today's episode of Just Another Fanboy Presents. Again, he says, as if trying to mask the fact that 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 your host is going from speaking off the top of his head into a scripted portion of the show the closing i'm you know i try to act like i can get into that naturally and i can't so let's start that over here's the closing that has been scripted i want to thank y'all for listening to today's episode of just another fanboy presents if you want to drop me a line ask me a question provide a bit of feedback or just tell me what you think turtles get up to when they're all alone inside their shell you can do that right now by emailing me at just another fanboy at gmail.com Or you can use the Just Another Fanboy voice line at 785-318-6673, and you can leave a voicemail or send me a text. Just make sure that if you're sending a text, let me know who you are, because I will use that in a future episode as feedback when we hopefully do a feedback episode. You can also reach out to me on Twitter by using the handle at Stephen or else, or join in on all the fun over at the message boards by going to forum.justanotherfanboy.com. Dot com. And hey, if you feel inclined to throw a little support my way, because podcasting does cost a little bit of cheddar each and every month, you can join the Patreon for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash Stephen R. Orr. And in return, I'm going to do my very best to get you podcast episodes just like this one before anybody else gets them. And by anybody else, I mean anyone but you and your fellow patrons. Patrons? patrons. And you know, I get people asking me all the time, and by all the time, I mean never, no one has ever asked me this, but just in case, what if, uh, uh, hey, Stephen, what if I want to give more than a dollar a month? Well, you can do that at the Patreon. You can you can choose to, to give $100 a month if you want, but the minimum is a dollar. That's That's where it starts, folks. While I do have various tiers, I mean, really, as far as what you're getting for being a member, of the Patreon, you're getting episodes before most people uh, as often as I can. And that starts right there at a dollar a month. Now, beyond all that, I would really uh, freaking love it deep, deep down in my heart if you rated and reviewed this show wherever you get your podcast. Of, Of course, that option has to be available like on Apple Podcasts. But if it does, I certainly would appreciate it. And uh, just a reminder that all the links and the email address and the phone number I gave you there during the scripted portion of the show will be listed in your show notes. So, yeah, I'm supposed to say join me back here next week for for, for uh, week number seven. But I already did that. I already told you that we're going to talk about Action Comics 685. So there's really nothing else left to say except bye. So, uh, yeah, bye. Bye.